So, I'm in Nashville. You're not in Nashville, you're in Hermitage. Oh, sorry. I'm in Hermitage with uh, RJ Ronquillo. Hey! <laughs> so we were hanging out and we decided we should talk about five things we think every guitar player should know. All skill levels, all backgrounds, all playing styles, doesn't matter. These are five things that if you play guitar, you should know and uh, probably employ every day, every time you pick up your guitar. Every day. I feel like guitar players are paid to deal with cables full time. I mean, that's most of our job is just managing cables, power cables, signal cables. So every guitar player needs to know how to wrap a cable the right way. So, RJ? So, this is the, uh, the over-under technique. Uh, I learned this in college, among other things. So you wrap it like you would normally wrap a cable on the first wrap, and then you wanna kinda take an underhand grasp of the uh, cable and pull it kinda behind this wrap, and then alternate it. And this way, you don't get any tangles, you don't get any knots. So the way you can tell if you've got your cable wrapped properly is when you get to the gig, you should be able to unfurl the cable. I like to just toss it. Take your one in and then you can toss it back to your amp or your camera. It should unfurl evenly with no knots, no tangles or anything. Pro level. I hope you shut that in 120. <laughs> okay, number two on the list. Every guitar player should know some basic setup techniques. So how to adjust your truss rod, where your neck is sitting, because as seasons change, or if you're traveling with your guitar, going in different environments, your setup is going to move because guitars are made of wood mostly. So, RJ. All right, so the first thing that I'll notice is, you know, when I'm playing, um, sometimes if I hear that strings are buzzing, then I know that uh, the action needs to be raised or sometimes the neck has to be adjusted or if uh, the strings feel too high, same deal. And the first thing I'll do is I'll kind of eye down the neck. Some people do it this way, some people do it this way, but I prefer this way. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of a curve going this way, uh, which some people prefer, but I prefer to get it as uh, flat as possible with just a little bit of curvature. And to adjust that, you just, on most guitars, there's a truss rod going down the middle of the neck and you, you'll take the appropriate uh, Allen wrench. When you tighten it this way, righty tighty, right? Mm -hmm. It straightens out the neck and uh, lefty, it'll give it more curvature. And then from there, you adjust the intonation. The intonation is basically uh, playing in tune all up and down the neck. And the way to do that, the way I was taught, was you'd play a, a harmonic at the 12th fret and fret it, and they should be exactly in tune or very close to being in tune. And if not, you uh, make the appropriate change at the bridge, which uh, we've discussed this. <laughs> but essentially what you're doing is either lengthening or shortening the string. The distance between the bridge and the nut controls the intonation, where the guitar plays in tune or not all up and down the neck. So by adjusting these screws on a Tele style bridge, down here at the end, the base plate of the bridge, you can uh, make that string either longer or shorter to adjust your intonation. Much like the truss rod adjustment, you wanna go in very, very small increments. Don't yeah, to full disclosure, I just kinda go, and you do too, we go back and forth until we get it right. And if, uh, if you're not comfortable with it, consult a professional, Yeah. which we're not. I mean, we're professionals, but not in the sense of setting up guitars. We're professionals in, I guess, playing guitars. Yeah. So the next thing on the list is how to dial in any amp for any room and any guitar. And I actually learned this from watching a Matt Schofield video a few months ago and how he dials in his amps uh, to different rooms. Because when you're on the road and you're playing different clubs each night, your amp is going to sound different and feel different in each room. And depending on what guitar you're playing or if you're playing backline amps where each amp is different, this is kind of a foolproof way of getting a really great tone out of any amp. So what I like to do, and I learned this from Matt, is start with your EQ controls basically on zero. And RJ, if you'll just start playing, what happens is as you start to turn the control, you'll find the sweet spot of the control where it really starts to work. So on this Fender Vibrolux here, on the treble control, I have nothing. Right between five and six is where the treble starts to open up. Right there. 
So that's where I'll leave that treble control. Then with the bass, I'll do the same thing. Start at one. And the bass really starts to open up at like four. And so now I've got a pretty good bass line to start with, so RJ can play and kind of tune it. I never realized uh, using that uh, way of finding, uh, you know, where the the treble pot kind of activates, yeah. and then using that as your starting point. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and each amp is different. Like depending on the circuit, and depending on the pots and everything that they're using, some amps right as you start to crack that EQ control open is right where it's most effective, and then as you roll it up more, it doesn't do as much. Fenders generally are right their sweet spots right around like four and six on right. the control so if you look at how we've got this vibra luck set up now it's right here trebles on like six and a half bass is on five and i think that's a pretty solid place to start and then depending on what guitar you're using what pedals you're using the room you're in the room you're in it's a pretty pretty safe place to start the old way i used to do it was just put everything on five right in the middle and go but some amps five or the middle of the control could be too much of yeah. something to start with so i always go like this that's where i start yeah 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 oh god and then that's, us <laughs> then that's usually the, the my sound yeah everything on 10 yeah well i learned that from uh, back to the future <laughs> yeah you so did do that. yeah that, that is the that's the the marty <laughs> method right <laughs> so tip number four every guitar player should know how to solder uh, it helps you to do not only guitar electronics, but like repairing cables. It'll save you a ton of money. Uh, you don't have to go out and buy a new cable every time you get a short. You can just, you know, snip off one of the ends of the cables, undo this and resolder it and you're good to go. Yeah. And that way too, you can get away with buying some cheaper cables and as they break, which they will, you just have some extra ends around and like RJ said, clip the ends off, solder them up, and you're still good to go. And you can swap pickups in your guitars easily if you know how to solder. You can mm -hmm. get DIY pedal kits and build your own pedals. You can get amp kits and build your own amps. Yeah. And it's not hard to do. But I do suggest getting a really decent soldering iron because I've, I've gone through cheap Radio Shack ones, which, you know, Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore, but... Uh, just go on Amazon and, and find a decent, decently priced uh, soldering iron and uh, one that'll last you a couple years and you'll be good to go. Yeah. It's worth it. Also, higher quality soldering irons will go to higher temperatures and the actual iron tips will last a lot longer than cheap irons. Uh, so I'll actually link a couple of good ones in the description box down below. And the last tip and probably the most important tip, especially if you're looking to be a professional guitar player, is learning how to properly flick a pick into the audience. Now there's a spe special technique. Um, some people do it like a Frisbee. Some people kind of do it like a, you're skipping a rock. Mm -hmm. The way I like to do it is kind of this vertical motion. Right. So it's you're rolling, you know, from your bicep, or no, from your shoulder, and kind of rolling it out to the to the, the crowd, to the girl in the front row. Yeah, it's a nice flourish too. It's interesting because I just learned this. RJ and I uh, have the exact same pick flick technique, the the unfurl, if yeah, you will. It's You, you want to snap it at the end, kind of like a, the tail of a dragon. A rookie move is just throwing it out to the crowd. So you want to have some accuracy to be able to target a specific person. Maybe you want to hit third row, kind of, you know, stage left a little bit. You know, a lot of it's in the wrist motion. And I like to do between my first finger or my first two fingers, right? You mm -hmm. between, yeah. So, you know, hold the pick right here. And like RJ said, just unfurl. And it's a snap of the wrist at the end. So you just 
Like but that. you also you also want to be very careful because uh, I've blinded a few people uh, due to the power the, the sheer power aim above their heads mm -hmm. just to be safe because they can always reach up and grab it which is what you want to do you don't want to aim for an eyeball yeah. or a mouth because that could turn into a really dirty scene. Right. Yeah. I mean, always safety third with this kind of stuff. So the other thing to think about too is what type of pick you're actually flicking. You know, the the different materials and thicknesses are going to travel through the air differently. So I'm a big fan of like the Dunlop Tortex uh, 1.5 millimeters, and I flick these the best just because I'm I'm you know the most comfortable with these. But occasionally I'll go with a thinner pick. And uh, they're a little faster off the wrist. So you have to adjust your, your wrist motion here the thinner the pick is. But I play with quarters. So that can be great. You know, the weight is great to flick, but it also it's very, very dangerous. So yeah. um, maybe I'll switch to a nickel mm. in the future. But, uh, yeah. you know, quarters from like 1974 to 1979 is my favorite yeah it's year. interesting because the uh the, the copper nickel content and the quarters from the, the mid 70s were really not only the best for tone you really want to stay away from quarters from like the early 2000s 2002 to 2005 those like state quarters yeah, that they were not, doing yeah they're not really yeah they're not real quarters yeah they're not you, you got to get something from the early to mid 70s but yeah. uh anyway i digress this is the kind of pro rock star content you're going to get here yeah, you're uh, when, only gonna get it from us. Yeah. We're we're, we're giving up all the secrets yeah. to you guys. So. so be sure to subscribe to my channel here and to RJ's channel, which is linked in the description box down below. Those are five tips every guitar player uh, should know to be a pro. Yeah. There you go. Like us. Oh, God, my core machine gets so bad. <laughs>